the fourth floor of the Pagoda. Ji Han Jae was born in 1936 in Ang Dong, South Korea. Already an eighth man black belt by his early 20s, in 1957 he combined all his knowledge into a hybrid form he called Hapkido. There is some dispute whether Ji actually invented Hapkido. It cannot be argued that he was foremost in promoting and teaching it far and wide, eventually founding the Korea Hapkido Association in 1965. Bruce Lee first met Ji Han Jae in 1969, when the latter was in the United States to teach Hapkido to members of the Secret Service and other branches of the US government, including President Richard Nixon's security detail. While staying at Andrews Air Force Base, a mutual friend, Taekwondo Grandmaster Jun Ree, introduced the pair, and Lee asked Ji to teach him some moves. In 1972, Golden Hubs director Huang Fo recruits Ji, along with his right-hand man Huang in Shik, to train the cast of his upcoming film, Hakido. Ji and Huang also play roles in the film, and it is on the set at Golden Harvest Studios where Ji once again makes the acquaintance of Bruce Lee, who is filming The Way of the Dragon at the same time. Bruce enlists Wong and Shik's services as an actor on The Way of the Dragon, playing a Japanese fighter near the end of the film. And soon enough, he is offered both Wong and Ji acting roles in The Game of Death. Wong's role is the guardian of the first floor of the pagoda, but other than some exterior footage we'll discuss later, his scenes never make it before a camera. Jihan Jae, on the other hand, plays the guardian of the fourth floor, and as it happens, his is the last of the major fight scenes for the game of death that Bruce Lee ever lives to film. Filming resumes on October 22nd, exactly where we left off nearly a month prior, with Bruce Lee, James Tien, and Che Yi Won ascending the stairs and arriving at the Hall of the Dragon a level in which the action demonstrates some of Lee's most inventive and imaginative choreography. To begin our breakdown of Lee's choreographic approach, we must look at one aspect often overlooked, the space. For the second time, the soundstage is redressed to differentiate it from the previous two levels already shot, and it is for this level, Lee could for a more visually off-kilter look as mentioned previously, the somewhat illogical and dreamlike setting of the game of death has often been compared to a previously scrapped project of Lee's, The Silent Flute. In that film, Lee would mix his esoteric philosophical ideas with 1960s psychedelia. This creative impulse is most pronounced in this fourth level, where the overall art direction leans towards more otherworldly sensibilities. We immediately see this as Ji Han Jae emerges behind a ghostly white veil, his gi seamed with gold lapels, and wrapped around his waist, an equally blinding gold belt. They constantly glimmer in the light, almost as if to distort the senses of anyone who lays eyes on this guardian. Even Ji's choice to drench the room with a harsh red light evokes a mildly psychedelic sensation. The red light is explained in the fourth floor guardian's only major line of dialogue, written by Bruce as follows. As you gentlemen know, red spells danger. Therefore, I advise you people not to step into this warning arena. If you want to go on living, stop here and go back downstairs. Life is precious. In a moment, we'll see a break in the action when Che Yuan charges at G. The ensuing fight, in which Ji easily beats both Che and James Tien, is not filmed until three days later on October 25th. Was the fight filmed on the 22nd and deemed insufficient, having to be reshot later? No footage survives to corroborate this theory. Instead, we return to a similar angle, where Che and Tien rub their wounds as Lee approaches Ji for his turn at combat. The Hall of the Dragon marks a significant departure for Lee, as the choreography would involve heavy amounts of locks, throws, and grapples. As a screen fighter, Lee was primarily a striker, given his roots in Wing Chun, 
and his later employment of more personal fundamentals in his Jeet Kune Do. Employing Ji Han Jae's specific Hakkino skills shows Lee's ongoing impetus to widen his cinematic martial vocabulary. It was clearly a challenge as, unlike in Santo and Abdul Jabbar, Ji Han Jae was not someone Lee had trained extensively with. As such, there was a lack of familiarity with how they would move with one another. Of course, Lee was no less tenacious in wanting to create a spectacular duel while also keeping true to his philosophy. And it shows with tape after tape, experimentation after experimentation, all to best capture this clash of martial bodies. Lee is most renowned for his martial arts ability on and off the screen, and rightfully so. But this iconic status, coupled with the often critical dismissal of Kung Fu cinema, often belied his skills as a cinematic storyteller. Many forget that Lee was an actor first, and appreciated the craftsmanship of American and Japanese filmmakers. In fact, he believed the Hong Kong film industry should employ the same standard of artistry if it were to compete with the worldwide circuit. We can see this incentive at work as Lee gained more creative control, and it's particularly true in this penultimate duel. The first day's bullet concludes with Bruce's first blow against G, shot at a number of speeds and in multiple takes. When Lee first approaches Ju, he raises one hand to his opponent. The pose is a peculiar amalgamation of a fighting stance and a gesture to beckon his opponent to attack. It becomes obvious that Lee must make the first move. With the most deliberate pace, Lee retracts his hand and eventually reaches a crescendo, that being a dynamic roundhouse kick. To quote his choreography notes, he relaxes, smiles, and puts his hand back, and while keeping his smile, initiates a lightning right finger jab feint, follows instantaneously with a low high hook kick, with fluid speed, intense grace, and powerful one, two, three. Each gesture and movement are simple by design, but when utilized with the correct intent and rhythm as Lee does, it effectively establishes the narrative conflict and adds a level of anticipation and suspense. Through these rushes, we not only see the breakdown of Lee's choreographic decisions, but also his directorial decisions and his approach to storytelling. It must be stressed that these are rushes after all, far away from being a completed and refined product. But as with the previous two levels involving Inosanto and Abdul Jabbar, there is enough evidence here to show that Lee wanted to elevate what would be another one-on-one -on -one martial arts duel. Structurally, the Hall of the Dragon is no different to the Hall of the Tiger and the Hall of the Unknown, but they all possess their own key characteristic that influences the action unfolding at their centers. That characteristic could be obtrusive, like the darkness in the Abdul Jabbar fight, or insidious, like the harsh red light in this one. But given the planned order of these three levels, we do get a sense that the higher we climb the pagoda, the more otherworldly the surroundings become. All of this is further evidence that for Lee, the choreography isn't just about the interaction between two individuals. It is also the interaction with the space and how the action escalates when said space changes. The second day's filming begins with the second angle, only this time shot at regular speed. Two takes of an additional angle will also be filmed as part of the pickup filming three days later. If this fate is intended to demonstrate Haitian's canniness and unpredictability, then the next shot shows that he will have his work cut out.